I have been charged with introducing our panel, and I'm going to start with Carol Anderson. Dr. Carol Anderson is the Robert Woodruff Professor of African American Studies at Emory University. She, she is the author of several award-winning books, including White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial, Racial Divide, which won the 2016 National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism and also a New York Times bestseller, a New York Times editor's pick, and is listed on the Zora list of 100 books by black women authors since 1850. That was a long time ago. <laughs> she has been elected to the Society of American Historians, named a W.E.B. Du Bois Fellow of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences, and selected by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Anderson has been elected to the American Philosophical Society. She has also been selected as the recipient of the Ella Baker Lifetime Achievement Award by the Hurston Wright Foundation. She earned her PhD in history from the Ohio State University. What I want to say about Dr. Anderson is the rest of us get 24 hours in a day. Dr. Anderson has figured out some arrangement with the universe to get extra time. I don't know how she has done it, but she writes a book and gets an award after every meal. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Dr. Cynthia Neal Spence is an associate professor of sociology at Spelman College and the director of the UNCF Mellon programs. Her, her interest in issues of higher education access, higher education access, ra racial and gender equality and diversity frame her research writing and community service involvement and public speaking. As director of the UNCF Mellon programs, Dr. Spence creates, manages, and oversees um, a suite of future faculty development mm -hmm. uh, and faculty <laughs> career enhancement. Dr. Spence also serves as the founding director of the Spelman College Social Justice Fellows Program. The Social Justice Program is a living and learning community program that attempts to match students' intellectual interests with their social justice advocacy passions. Dr. Spence serves as the director of the Truth uh, Truth Racial Healing and Trans Transformation Center, an initiative sponsored by the American Association of Colleges and Universities and the Spelman College Principal Investigator for Crafting Democratic Futures Project, sponsored by the University of Michigan Center for Social Solutions and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. She has served as a consultant for the Ford Foundation Institutional Transformation Project, the University of Chicago Provost Initiative on Minority Affairs, and the Agnes Scott College Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, and the Georgia Department of Corrections. Dr. Spence is a graduate of Spelman College. <laughs> and she received her master's and PhD from Rutgers University. <laughs> what I want to say about Dr. Spence is, Cynthia Spence and I got our PhDs at the same time while we were working full time at Emory University. I'm sorry, at Spelman College. Woo. So I had a flashback there. We were working full-time together, finishing our PhDs, working full-time at Spelman College. When you get a job while you're still finishing your doctorate, you feel like you've pulled a fast one. And then you get there and you realize, no, they have pulled a fast one on you. Yeah. But I want, I want to say that Cynthia really helped me survive my years at Spelman College. That was um, a unique experience for me. This is what I want to say about Cynthia Spence. Cynthia is the person that, after one of our very interesting meetings, you could find Cynthia in the hallway, and I would say, girl, and she would say, I know. And she, I would say, what, but, what? And she said, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm like, but what are we going to, I don't know. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. So, oh, well, and then we would just have this conversation. And just if you were listening, we sounded illiterate, basically. But, you know, it's what I would call sister speak, right? She understood. I would go sit in Cynthia's office and just shake my head and say, oh, no. Oh, no. I'm not sure what's going to happen now. She, it'll, it'll be all right. Okay. Next, I want to introduce Janera Easley. She 
She is an assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies at Emory University. Her research advances sociological insight in three key areas, the role of space in reprodu reproducing racial stratification through the lens of neighborhood context, such as residential segregation. I'm going to get y'all to turn in some bios that are a little easier to read <laughs> next time. The measurement of structural racism and its multi-level mechanisms and systematic impediments to economic well-being across racial groups while being attentive to nativity and gender dynamics. Ultimately, her research identifies new insights regarding racial inequities in home ownership, wealth earnings, intergenerational mobility, and health, producing targetable and policy-relevant interventions to dismantle racial disparities. Yeah, next time you're gonna have to read that yourself. <laughs> Dr. Easley, not done, not done. Dr. Easley was the head of the second leg of the Emory Project, focusing on the determinants of the current state of housing in the Atlanta metro area. She interviewed stakeholders from various professions with the goal of developing a reparations plan that would both repair and advance the state of housing for black Atlantans. Now. Yes. Yes. Dr. Jessica Lynn Stewart. Woo. Is an assistant professor of African American studies at Emory University. Her research and teaching focuses on the black public opinion, political geography, and political economy. Professor Stewart has published, Professor Stewart has published work on regional blackness and African American displacement due to neighborhood change. At present, she is working on her first book project inspired by her dissertation that is tentatively entitled, Are We There Yet? Race, Place, and Progress, which is under contract with Oxford University Press. Professor Stewart serves on the Executive Council of the National Com Conference of Black Political Science. She is a graduate of Denison University, where she triple majored, earning a bachelor's degree in philosophy, political science, and economics. She holds a master's of science degree in health systems management and completed an administrative fellowship at the Mayo Clinic before pursuing a doctorate. Professor Stewart earned her PhD in political science from the University of California, Los Angeles, Prior to arriving at Emory, she completed the Anna Julia Cooper Center Postdoctoral Fellowship at Wake Forest University. I want to say, if you do not know who Anna Julia Cooper is, you, and you have a passport, which I really hope you have, and it will really need to be like up to date. If, if you don't have an updated passport, when you leave here, go get your passport updated. But Anna Julia Cooper is the only black woman the, I'm sorry, the only woman quoted in every U.S. passport. There's a quote by Anna Julia Cooper in every U.S. passport. She's the only woman represented in the U.S. passport. Not the only black woman, the only woman, period, is Anna Julia Cooper. What I want to say about our junior faculty, Jessica and Janera, is I want to tell them how courageous it is for them to be on this stage with these heavy hitters, Carol and Cynthia. I'm not sure that I would have done it as junior faculty, <laughs> and I am very, very impressed. Um, I want to say that they are both so impressive, and it's really important that one of the things that we are doing in African American studies as a department is we are growing our own geniuses. And so, <laughs> by hiring junior faculty and uplifting them and encouraging them, this is how it works. I want to also say that there are some students here from our inaugural program, the PhD program in African American Studies. There will only be one inaugural class of the uh, PhD in African American Studies. There will only be one inaugural class. Thank you so much for being courageous enough to do that. Thank you so much for doing that. I'm sorry? Oh yes, please do stand up if you're in if you're in a program. Stand up. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're so glad to see you. We're so glad that you're here. We really are. I'm gonna step away from the mic. Who's I'm gonna step away from the mic and let the panelists move on. Hold on. What's happening? I don't understand what she's saying.
I would also like to thank our partners at Georgia Public Broadcasting. <laughs> thank you, Georgia Public Broadcasting. I'm very sorry. You were at the top of my list, and then I just started reading. But thank you very much for our partners at Georgia, Georgia Public Broadcasting. I also want to thank the events committee. Chandra, um, Janera, Kimberly. Is that it? Is it just three of us? Where is Janera? Is that it? We work so hard, it seems like there should be more of us. But thank you, I want to thank you uh, for all of your help with this. Thank you very much. I'm going to step away from the mic and let our panelists take over. That film, we needed a breath, didn't we? That issue of reparations is foundational to healing. It is foundational to the divides that we see in the United States. Because you heard it, because reparations requires, one, an acknowledgement of a wrong. And it requires, then, atonement. But the United States of America has yet to acknowledge the wrong. We know that because the battles that it takes to remove Confederate statues from public places where they are held in high esteem so they just removed one from Arlington Cemetery. It begins to tell you how difficult this is. And you also see the ways that, that the tricks of saying, well, you know, we're not responsible. But what that does is by providing that kind of historical distance and by then working to erase history, because this is what we're currently seeing right now, it allows them to be able to, to look at endemic poverty, to look at an, at an enormous wealth gap and say it's because black folks don't work hard. And it's what I call that narrative of black pathology that becomes absolutely essential in order to maintain the, the distance, to maintain the, the divide, to maintain inequality. This project, this film, and this project that we're on is part of a Mellon Foundation funded grant to nine different colleges and universities in an incredible consortium led by the University of Michigan and the former provost at Emory University, Earl Lewis. And it is about how do we heal? How do we make reparations real? And so you have the colleges and universities working in their various communities to begin to develop a plan with the community. So as you heard, nothing about us without us. And so I'm going to talk about the Emory Plan. The Emory Plan was about working with the Atlanta community and dealing with three tiers of systemic inequality. So our incredible colleague who is now retired, Vanessa Siddle Walker, who is bad, that is a bad sister, I mean really bad. Um, and, and I meant that just the way I said it, she is bad. <laughs> she took on the issue of education because we know how foundational educational inequality is for sustaining deep systemic inequality. And she met with a group of educators and a group of parents over a series of meetings to flesh out what was taken, what was lost, and what is it gonna to take to heal? And what is it gonna to take to thrive? And then Janera Easley followed up with, in housing to look at, because we know how difficult housing is in Atlanta. When you think about gentrification, when you think about the destruction of public housing, when you think about the astronomical cost that it takes to live here for housing. How did that happen? And what is it going to take to heal? And then my colleague, Jessica, then looked at the issue of economic opportunity. Because what we know is that one of the things that you hear about Atlanta is it is the black Mecca. How many have heard that? Yes. You know, so this is where you come to really get it. So what happens when you have this aura of the black Mecca, but you have deep systemic inequality that can't match that? That is what she is working on in this grant. Um, and so we're gonna pull it all together and then write it up all together and then send it back out to the community to make sure we've got it right. And then we're gonna send it into Mellon. All 
All right, so you know, I, I take my lead from the distinguished Dr. Carol Anderson, who I just adore as a um, colleague, friend, sister friend. And so again, anytime I'm on, I'm on the um, podium or a platform with her, I'm just honored. So I just want to say that. And also to thank you to the African American Studies Program. Um, we've had a long history of working with this very distinguished program here at Emory University. So again, thank you all. And I'm just so proud of our PhD folks. So you go. <laughs> but let me just tell you about Spellman's project. Um, first of all, how many of you did have to take a breath after this film? You know, it's, it's, it's heavy, it's really heavy and it's painful. And that was my word when we saw it the first time. This is my third time seeing it. Um, it's painful for us to really think about our history of um, marginalization and disenfranchisement, but we know it is our history. And the Spellman Project um, really has kind of organically formed around a, a number of existing initiatives that we had at Spellman College prior to being introduced to Randy Quarterman and Sarah Eisner. We have a social justice program, and one of our goals has been for our students to merge their intellectual interests with their social justice passions. And so they were already um, primed to look at issues of maternal, you know, maternal, um, the, the, you know, the um, disparities within healthcare. They were already looking at educational access issues. They were already um, looking at issues of, that, um, that reside within the criminal justice system and the injustices that we see there. So we have core groups of students who are already working in this area. And Spellman also was designated as a center for truth, racial healing, and transformation because we also were engaged in something that we call difficult dialogues, where we would just get students together and let them run it, but they would talk about issues that were framed by our understanding of how race, gender, sexuality, class really serve to order our lives, and particularly as um, black women. And so we thought that clearly the work that we were already doing would in fact fall under our umbrella of truth, racial healing and transformation. And then Michael Tyler, who was featured in the film as the, one of the lead attorneys for Sarah and, and um, Randy approached me and he said, I want to introduce you to this woman. Uh, her name is Sarah Eisner. He gave me the history, you know, the tracing heirs property and what have you. And he says that she wants to do something for women's education as a part of her reparatory work. Um, clearly, her, her um, great, 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 great grandfather in deeding the land to the Quartermans had also deeded money to a women's college in the Savannah area. But that college is no longer in existence. And so he connected me to Sarah. And I talked with Sarah a while just to get a bit of their history. And I said, I can build a program around your story. And so we actually created the Quarterman Keller Scholars Program. So named for Randy and Sarah. And it was very important to both of them that the Quarterman name come first. Not the Keller Quartermans, but the Quarterman Keller. So every, every interaction has actually been about trying to do repair work. And so our Quarter McKellar scholars, and we have one here now, um, we have others um, who are part of this program. Uh, today's the first day of class, and so it's hard to get students out, but we have students who represent Clark Atlanta University, Spelman College, as well as Morehouse College, who are Quarter McKellar scholars, and those were the individuals that you saw in that room. Well, we're doing this work, and we thought that it was important for us to actually train our students to do oral histories of the Quarterman and Keller families. And so they have done an oral history of Sarah Eisner. They've done one of Randy Quarterman, and that work continues. But in doing that work, then we get a call from Earl Lewis and says, I got this big project, and it's focusing really on trying to engage in community discussions as the Emory staff are doing, I mean, Emory faculty are doing so well, talking with members of the community about, you know, what would it even look like? 
if we were able to move this work forward. And so again, I told myself, well, we're already doing something on the you know, personal level, the family to family level. And so for us, and so of course we become a part of crafting democratic futures. As an institution that was literally built in response to the disenfranchisement of black people and black women, Spelman College. It is always first and foremost for us to equip our students with the knowledge so that they can go out and actually literally change the world. And so our project has focused more on working with Sarah and Randy. Randy um, Quarterman is actually working with community members in the Savannah, Port Wentworth area because not only are they talking about their land dispossession, but industry is moving into Savannah and they are actually moving others away from their land and they're trying to convince individuals who've lived in Savannah for their entire lives to sell their land. And for some, this sounds like a good idea because they're elders and they want, you know, comfortable retirements. And so we are funding Randy and another individual in Savannah to actually hold community meetings, to actually understand on the ground level what would reparations look like? But what are some of the real complexities around? This is complicated stuff. Even with the land dispossession or land reclamation, it's very complicated because you're dealing with human beings and their feelings. And so we've been spending a lot of time working with Randy and another gentleman in Savannah to help support that work. We've been trying to expose our students not only to the histories of Randy and Sarah, but we've also exposed them to another woman in North Georgia, Stacy Marshall, who also discovered that her family farm was actually had a history of, of slave ownership. And she found out um, that there was a woman who served as a nursemaid to most of the women in her family. And so her name was Hester. So this is another documentary that we've been exposing our students to. And, and I'll talk with you all more about our work because I don't want to and to um, take up too much time. But again, most of our work has been training students to gather information, to do oral histories, exposing our students to the various ways reparations can in fact be actualized. They've certainly um, had the opportunity to spend time with Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen who say nothing should be called reparations unless you're talking about the federal government paying its debt. They say everything else is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So they've been exposed to that, but they've also been exposed to Sandy and Randy said, we want to do this family to family. Or Stacy Marshall, who says, well, I know who the descendants of Hester are, so I want to do community work with her. And so we're trying to learn about that. Or they are actually being exposed to the scholars who are doing this work. Last night, our two of our students, one of our students who's here now was in conversation with Clint Smith. It talks about how the word is passed. We want our students to be carriers of the word. And so one of the ways that we are engaging this work is really strengthening their intellectual understandings of the complexities around reparations, but also to have firsthand engagement with individuals who are, who are actually doing the work of reparations at various levels. So I'll talk later. Um, so I just want to share some initial reactions and um, connect that back to the work that I did in my leg of the research. Um, the first thing that really I wanted to emphasize that really sits with me is just the long history of um, advocating for reparations and all the labor and time that has gone into that, like an additional unpaid labor. Um, so at least one of our participants has been doing that work in um, a local area around here. Um, and so it, just to sit back and think about um, how long this has been going on and, and just the fact that we haven't made much progress, at least on the federal level, of, of actually seeing this come to pass. And just it's an additional toll on people to have to do this work. Um, and then the second thing is, so um, I can't remember who it was, but one of the speakers talked about pulling the thread from a sweater. 
Um, and that is definitely a theme that resonates from the interviews that I did, because I sat down and asked these participants, like, how did we get here in terms of housing in Atlanta? And there was a laundry list of things that had happened, um, everything from the race massacre in 1906 to um, weaponized code enforcement used to move people out of their house to um, developers flooding neighborhoods to kind of save other neighborhoods. Um, People talked about the Olympics and the Beltline even and all the things that kind of happened with that. And so um, one of the things that Carol and Vanessa charged us with were, were just to not think about um, repaying the pair, but like what it would take for us to thrive in this area. And it just really emphasizes just how comprehensive a response would need to be. Um, and I don't want that to take away from the local level projects that are happening, because I think it's about both and. Um, but the, the work just really emphasizes that uh, same way the documentary did, this doesn't stop at slavery, it doesn't stop at Jim Crow, these are things that are continuing to happen and, and resources are continuing to be extracted from these neighborhoods and from black Atlantans even now. Yeah, I, I would, I'll start with just saying, um, I, I, I heard something in the film that really stuck with me, which is like, you feel your ancestors on your back. And I think um, that's definitely um, how I came to this work. It is, I think me and, me and Janera were both, Dr. Eastley, we're both very much quantitative data, like social scientists. So when we were asked to join this project, it's like, oh, okay, like, do you, you know what we do? <laughs> um, but <laughs> it was so nice to be pushed intellectually in this way. And immediately when I start doing it, you feel it. You're like, you feel that, oh, this is like really important. This is really special. Um, but it was also interesting, and again, just to come into this work, I never thought I would really do reparations. Like, it was not on my list. Um, and then I went home. I remember going back to Chicago and just talking to people, like, what are you working on? I'm like, I'm working on this reparations project, this big melon grant. It's $5 million. Um, and, and people, the re reactions were not what I expected, right? People were not like, oh, yeah, good job. Like, great work. Go forth. Um, people in my community, black folks were like, yeah, whatever, like it ain't happening, right? And that was kind of, that was very disheartening for me um, because it was like, as I'm digging into the research more and more, I'm seeing the documents, I'm seeing this, like the debt, it's, it's in black and white in the archives. And I'm trying to convince my own people that like, this is important. This is not like make believe, this is not far off. This is not something someone made up. It's not a myth. Um, these are things that happen to you and your descendants. and. This is really a debt that is old, and it's not a handout. It's not something that you should feel ashamed to talk about. Uh, and so that was just personally really just an interesting moment in my scholarly journey, right, to have that type of experience, to study something that is so important and to see such like a generational divide, racial divide, everyone's all over the place in terms of what they think about this topic. Um, and so I'm, I understand the idea, like, well, don't call it reparations, like, but I don't know what the other word is. Um, so <laughs> that's gonna be interesting. Uh, in terms of the work I specifically did, um, it was just really good, like I said, go, do, I, I had never done archival work, and this was my first chance. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is like the original, this is the document. Uh, <laughs> and so it was so cool. And I loved just working with the graduate students and um, seeing kind of understanding like slavery, how it starts in Georgia and that the leaders weren't really all that into it, but they knew that they could not get ahead economically. They would not be able to compete as a state unless they engaged into the institution. Um, and so just seeing that, like how they were thinking about slavery at that time, um, and then just my work going kind of towards the Atlanta massacre and understanding kind of how some white folks were jealous of black people having businesses at that time and that they were doing well. And so you hear about Tulsa, but you don't hear about the Atlanta massacre, partially because it doesn't vibe with that Atlanta Mecca narrative. Um, and so black Mecca narrative, I'm sorry. So therefore, um, that was really interesting going forward and thinking about the ways in which black people in this city have been moved around um, for the sake of economic development. And I think that's the area where me and Dr. Eastley's work kind of came together, whether it be African-American housing being demolished in favor of this project or moving these people over here to make this happen and selling it as for the good of the city. It's for the betterment of Atlanta. Um, and 
we were able to find like Negro removal documents and what, what they were saying about that and how they were actually attaching values to the homes that they were kind of trying to displace people out of. And they were thinking about the value of the land. Um, and so that was really important to me. Um, I did a long, a really long form interview with uh, Marquis Tate, who's the president of the Black Chamber of Commerce here in Atlanta. And our conversation just brought up so much about, it's really not just about the past. Like black business owners, black workers in the city of Atlanta are struggling right now in the black Mecca. Um, and so one of the, some of the things that came out of that was thinking about government contracts and the ways in which black um, businesses struggle to compete for contracts with the city, the way companies that have contracts with the city are supposed to hire a certain amount of minority um, employees and often miss that mark and they have to report that. And so you see in these documents where companies are like, we tried, but it didn't work out. And, and there's like, okay, they got the contract anyway, but they're gonna work on it and we're gonna give them six months. And you're just like, no, what? Um, and, and so again, to see that stuff in those documents was really powerful. Um, and then I'll, I'll just end in saying that this project really left me um, with a real appreciation for why we just have to fight really hard for education. Um, because I think it's a matter of white people don't know a lot of this stuff, black people don't know a lot of this stuff, just no one knows a lot of this stuff. And so we're all talking from a place of ignorance. And, and I think it would just do us all some good if, if we really push. I wish like, I just thought about it. my daughter learned colonialism in fifth grade in Chicago. And I'm like, well, if she was in Florida, would she have learned? Yeah. Um, but it's important, right? And so it's not a shock when she gets to college. Cause I see it as a, sh we see it as a shock in our classes that like, oh, this race thing is like real, real. It's like, yeah, um, and you've been living in it. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so just again, that's, I came across from this, uh, away from this really feeling like we have to push just more knowledge, more education um, and meshing this, the disciplines together, this interdisciplinary work, um, seeing how like, education and housing and employment to do that together and have that synergy between professors, um, that was just a really good thing and be able to pick off each other in terms of what we're finding. I want to just comment on, on something that you were saying. Uh, well, it's a couple of things, because you all was just so brilliant. And, and I want to talk to Emory about, why can't there be affiliate faculty members at Spelman? Or we got to work out some kind of arrangement here. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. But two points. Um, the lack of knowledge. And there's an assumption that black people, that we as black people, oh, well, we know all of this, but we actually don't because none of us was taught this history. And so what I say to my white counterparts when I'm doing truth, racial healing and transformation work, they'll just say, well, I didn't know. And I said, well, I didn't either. You know, we because the system, and so we look at systemic, these structural barriers to really getting to real honest discussions about reparations because it's almost built against us. The structure does not want us to know. And that's one of the reasons why we're having so many book bans and all of the conversation about you know, anti-wokeism or you know we don't want critical race theory taught to kindergartners. All of that, which is you know, ridiculous because we can laugh at it, but it is in fact ways in which we believe that knowledge, knowledge will in fact produce change, right? And so individuals are afraid that the more we know, the better we will become. And so we even know that as a part of our history as people of African descent, we were not even allowed to learn how to read and write because they've always known, individuals have known that knowledge is power. And so when I think about the work that all of us are doing, or all of us should be doing, we should be trying to share as much information as possible and not be afraid to say, I didn't know that. Because most of us didn't know it. None of us was taught this history. So that's one thing, I, one point I wanted to make about it is, and it's incumbent upon black people and white people to step in and say, wait a minute, let me learn a little bit more about this. Or when we see, when we see instances where individuals are being disenfranchised, marginalized, treated unfairly because of their own physical characterizations, then we should step in and say, wait a minute, don't 
do that. You know, we talk about being anti-racist. And so being anti-racist means that we take a stance. We will speak up. And, and that's difficult for all of us. But we have to be, have that courage. The other part of it is that it's very courageous for people like Randy and Sarah and all of the individuals who were featured here to really share their stories. And we have a very close relationship with Randy and Sarah. And I just want you all, it's not easy work. It's not even easy work for the two of them sometimes to really kind of share these common histories that bind them together. Randy has even said, I don't want to take a DNA test because I'm afraid of what it might tell me about how connected I am to Sarah Eisner. So, so I, I want to share that because these are difficult, difficult, um, stressful relationships, but we also know that they're necessary, that they are necessary. And lastly, when we talked, and you were talking about the resistance that, you know, when people say, I'm doing reparations work, we took a group of students to Savannah, and we worked with Pat Gunn and met men, uh, uh, several individuals and really were having these conversations about reparations. But many of the black people that we talked with were very tentative. They were like, well... I don't know about that. I don't know. And it was clear, I was putting my sociological hat on, and I said, it's something about a cultural milieu. You know, where people are socialized in a particular space, we internalize certain ideologies, and so we are afraid to talk about certain issues, or things aren't so bad. So maybe we shouldn't even, you know, ruffle the feathers of others. So I just wanted to talk about the complexities that are associated with doing this work on so many levels. And I want to provide yet another historical perspective on reparations. So what we, it sounds like what we're talking about is that the U.S. just doesn't do reparations. But it does. In the 1890s, a group of Italian sailors were lynched down in Louisiana. The Italian government went, what did you do? And the US said, oops, sorry. And actually paid reparations not only to the families of those lynched sailors, but also to the Italian government. Then of course, there was the internment of the Japanese, which the film talked about. And it took a while. No doubt about it, it took a while. But the US government paid reparations to the descendants and to the Japanese themselves for that internment. And they had their land stripped from them. They had their, their businesses stripped from them as they were basically told to move like that and get into the interior of the nation and go into basically a concentration camp. And it took, like I said, it took a minute, but the US government said, we are so sorry. Here's $20,000 each. We are so sorry. So this government has the capacity and the ability to understand significant, sizable wrongs. And it has the capacity and the ability to say, oops, sorry, we messed up big. And it has the capacity to say, here is how we're going to compensate you for that. And I think another big piece of this is because this has gone on for so long. I mean, that's part of what we, we doesn't get reconciled with is that we're talking about from 1619 on. And so slavery, absolutely doggone lootly. The redemption era, absolutely doggone lootly. Jim Crow, oh yeah. Because here you see the power of policies going in place to absolutely strip African Americans of, of their citizenship and of their resources. And so when you think about these, these Jim Crow schools, when you think about what they're designed to do, so Tamika Brown Nagan has a great book about Atlanta public schools called The Courage to Dissent. And you see the, the data coming through about the disparities in the schools for black children and the schools for white children. And you see how hard white families fought against black children getting a quality education. It lays it out. When you think about housing and, and, and the Hulk and the FHA and then the GI Bill, in the GI Bill, so that should be like 
doggone, just like, duh. Because, you know, these are for veterans. And, you know, this is America. We love our veterans. <laughs> Some of them. But there was language in there, in that GI Bill, about it would be under local control. So what that meant, for instance, in Mississippi was that with almost 3,000, in 1947, with almost 3,000 home loans provided under the GI Bill, only two went to black folk in Mississippi. And we all know that there's more than two, more than two black people in Mississippi. So you got to work really hard to come up with only two. And you begin to think about what that disparity means when you look at housing and how housing appreciates in certain areas. And let's also talk about zoning laws. It's the way that zoning laws allow certain businesses and entities to be placed in black neighborhoods, but not in white neighborhoods, knowing that that is going to depreciate the value. All of this is real. So slavery, absolutely. Slavery set the tone. But it's the policies afterwards that continue to set the tone, that continue to do this work. And it's the policies, as we're talking about, that are in Atlanta right now that continue to do this work. And so that requires us to think about. So that's why when we, we asked the, the people that we, we interviewed, what happened? What will it take to, to heal? And then what will it take to thrive? Because this is about being able to thrive, not just survive. And that is going to require thoughtful, comprehensive work. It's going to require a bunch of money, but a, a bunch of money invested appropriately, invested where it can change the system that allows this mess to continue to happen. I would say just a great example of that. In one of the interviews, um, and this kind of combines housing and employment, um, the chairman had talked about, and think about like the future, rising real estate price, in Atlanta and what that does for black business owners. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was just like, we're not thinking about that. We call it the black Mecca, but black business owners are going to be pushed outside of the central city of Atlanta because no one's going to be able to rent or buy any commercial real estate. Uh, and so I think just doing this type of work and being able to pull out those, like, those little fine-tuned nuances, that, that is something that the, gov you know, the city of Atlanta government can be thinking about right now. Um, and put a program in place to kind of proactively address that issue. Uh, and so again, that's why doing this, these interviews with people who are on, in the community, on the ground, and can tell you the stuff that, you know, you, you probably just aren't gonna, isn't, you're not going to get out of a book. Um, it's really important. Can we open it up for questions? I would love that. So at this point, thank you so much. Let me thank our panelists again. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. This is just exactly the right panel to do this. Thank you so much for taking your time, your energy, and your effort for doing this. Thank you so much. So I have been instructed, um, as I said again, this is called the run of show. So I've been told that um, this is the discussion portion. I'm checking with my fearless leader over here, right? The discussion... And um, we want to ask about initial reflections. No? Or oh, just open it up. OK, she says it's OK to open it up. She has a few talking points on here. Let me just, I'm going to tease you for a minute, Sandra. She said, you know, we just want to lighten the mood a little bit. So maybe we would ask, why is it so hard for this nation to deal with reparations for African Americans? I was like, that's your idea of lightening the mood? <laughs> I don't think that's going to lighten anything, but we are absolutely opening the floor for discussion, and Alex has already paid me a small bribe to be first. <laughs> so, I, I will moderate this, and that means I will give you um, a sign when it's time for you to move on. I'm, I'm going to be uh, brief. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge certainly the work that you have all done. It's very important. It's very valuable. I'm um, just... Um, I'm just an observer, and from that perspective, I, I, I want to acknowledge. Oh, turn that way. What about these guys? <laughs> right, that's kind of like. Um, I just wanted to um, make a comment, I think, really, 
uh, maybe even a suggestion. You talked a lot about, and we all recognize that to understand reparations is a history. I would like to see, and I remember as I was growing up in grade school, the history that I learned came from a very simple book, a textbook, that from third to fifth grade we read, same textbook. Kind of simple, kind of outlined everything from the revolution, the Civil War, all these key points in our American history. I think one of the things, in, if, if it doesn't exist already, one of the things that could be added so that people can understand why reparations are appropriate is a simple textbook that can come from someone that would outline in simple form the history so that I can read as a third grader, a fourth grader, a fifth grader, I can learn from that level up what is the history that justifies reparation, the documents, the, the money. My suggestion, thank you. And Thank you, and it's a great one, but this is why there's such a battle. Um, this is why you have um, PragerU being acceptable as a form of, of education in Florida. The PragerU videos, I call it, um, remember Schoolhouse Rock? I call it the Klan for kindergartners. Because in those videos, you have Frederick Douglass being really cool with slavery. You have Christopher Columbus talking about, isn't it better that we enslave the indigenous people than to let them eat themselves? So this is what they're pumping in as acceptable from the Florida Department of Education to young children in their schools. This is why the battle is so intense. And this is why they, are, they have banned um, hundreds of books, um, books that deal with issues of racism, books that deal with issues of, I mean, so they banned the books on Ruby Bridges, the six-year-old girl who, who integrated the New Orleans public schools. They banned the books on Roberto Clemente. They banned the books on Rosa Parks. They banned Toni Morrison. They banned, they banned, they banned because they don't want children understanding how race works and how racism works. And so one of the things that I think what has led to this backlash is in 2020, there was a, a Black Lives Matter protest that happened in Washington, D.C. And there was, the cops were coming at this young black man. I mean, they were coming. And this young white woman jumped in front and got between him and the cops, and the cops stopped. Because, and so you could almost see the, the wheels turning. How did she know to do that? Where did she learn that? Where did she learn the power of her privilege? And to deploy that privilege in order to save a young black man. We have got to stop this. We can't have this. We can't have white folks defending black people. You saw that. And so, so part of what you're seeing here is we're going after education to make sure that young white kids don't do that ever again. That they don't understand that they're part of a greater community. That they're part of humanity. They have to learn to protect whiteness. I mean, so that's what you're seeing in the battle over education right now. And so there are these books that are being written, but they're being banned. Um, there, there are people who are, there, there's flooding our school boards um, to in fact make this happen. So that's why we have to be engaged to know what's happening in our school boards because our school boards are determining what books will be read in what schools and what our children will learn. My name is Shirley Lee. I'm a member of St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church and part of our Dismantling Racism group. I spent this morning, I spent, I, I mean, I thought I heard it going out. Okay. We want you to turn this way. 
Oh, oh. there you go. Ask that. Okay. I spent this morning uh, writing emails to Georgia legislators who are just about to take up SB 154. And I would like for all of you to do the same thing because that's the bill that wants to <laughs> criminalize librarians if they let their students check out books pertinent to LGBTQ plus and uh, be BIPOC issues. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you, Shirley. And, and hopefully you can say that again for the group, but what you're doing and what we're, we are seeing pockets of individual communities coming together clearly at your church, other churches, but other communities where there are these cross-racial discussions. I've been working with a group up in Brevard, North Carolina, long story, but long story. But they actually took that, well, the leaders took the 1619 book, mm -hmm. and they're going chapter by chapter. Mm -hmm. And they invite individuals to come and be in discussion with these cross racial groups about the 16, what they, the, the, the contents of the 1619 project. There are other groups that are doing people's tables where they're coming, cross racial groups are learning. So there are reading lists and you know, if they're going to ban the books in the schools, it's incumbent upon us to be able to share the books in other ways. And so we have to take responsibility until we can actually get some movement at the legislative level. But it's so important. Um, Spellman also, uh, the social justice program has the Georgia Women's Policy Institute cohort of students who are learning how to work with advocating for policies um, that are just um, policies through the Georgia, Georgia General Assembly. And it's frustrating, but at least they're learning what it's, you know, because we have to have policies to change, but we also have to have these community groups coming together to do their own education, particularly in a moment in history where education about very important cons constructs, concepts, dealing with building a more beloved community are being pulled back. And so I applaud what you're doing, but I say that we all have to do this work, very important work. I'll first greet you all, good afternoon. Before I greet the panel, and I wanna start by saying my name is Kira Malika Daniels, and I'm such a proud member of this Department of African American Studies. Ow! Those are my colleagues. I wanted to ask a question about collaborations regarding reparations movements. I'm from California. California has done a lot of harm but one thing that I think California has done that was pretty remarkable in the 1960s, my father was a student at Berkeley, part of the Third World Hunger Strike, was to invest in a pan-racial solidarity movement. You had the Black Panthers, you had figures like Richard Aoki, who was a descendant of and a survivor of the Japanese internment camps of Manzanar, being a part of the Black Panther movement. You saw Latinx people getting together with Asian Americans. My question is about First Nations people, because if we're gonna talk about reparations in this country, we have to recognize and acknowledge that simultaneously alongside our cry, our rallying cry for reparations for African Americans has been the rallying cry for reparations for First Nations people, indigenous peoples, thinking about returning bones, exhuming bones and returning bones to family members and to, to reservations. So do you see room for collaboration between First Nations peoples and African Americans in the movement for reparations? Or do you see that those movements are still too painful to be able to be combined in this country? So that's my question. Thank you so much for y'all's work. Kira, you always ask the hard question. <laughs> The, the work 
between the two groups, and the, there are multiple groups, let's, let's be real clear with that, um, is coalitions are hard. They're really hard. And so part of, remember that the Seminoles um, got a huge payment. But then they made clear that the African Americans who had been with them for centuries were not part of that, that were not part of the Seminoles. Even though they had been raised with them, grown up with them, the whole nine yards. So part of what we have to understand that is that divide and conquer is one of the quickest ways to blow apart movement, to blow apart progress. It is an old trick of British colonialism. And this is, the, again, the power of history to see how you can break folk apart who really do have a common interest. Um, and so we have to be aware of that. And so that is also why knowing the history and being able to talk through that history becomes so important because you begin to understand what's at stake. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? Um, and, and so I see that there is, there is room for that, but it's going to take real hard work. Yeah. And with the crafting, I think Earl in some ways had this in mind um, with the number of institutions that are part of the Crafting Democratic Futures collab well consortium of institutions. We do have a First, Na a First Nation institution, and I'm drawing a blank, the name of the institution. It, it will come to me, it's, it's fog in my head, but it will come to me. But I believe that's a part of Earl's dream, but at the same time, as a historian, he understands how complicated these histories are. And sometimes, you know, we have to um, try not to get into this oppression Olympics, you know, you know, which kind of becomes a natural byproduct, which can um, cause tensions among groups. But certainly, I believe that that's a part of his vision, yes. to bring organizations together, institutions at, at the higher education level. One quick note, everyone who's using the microphone, if you could just speak closely into the microphone, panelists and audience, thank you. And I will say at our um, final convening, there was, um, they did, we all did presentations from the schools and there was one that represented um, the Native American um, community and it was very powerful and they talked about the legacy of the boarding schools and working with descendants, those descendants and kind of um, dealing with all kind of the social issues within the community. So I don't know if it was more, more so that it's, the two groups are too painful or more so, like they're, they're both trying to get their steam, you know, and they almost need to get a little bit more established in their movement separately, I would say maybe before trying to combine forces. Yes, my name is Phil Cuffey and I'm co-chair of the Beacon Hill Black Alliance for Human Rights. And I want to thank you to, for all the panelists for your valuable contribution to begin with. And also to say that this knowledge is so important. And while we allude to it as being a source of power, it's really not maximized until we start to apply it and use it in a very meaningful way. And one of the ways that we're doing it in the city of Decatur is by going into the archives and searching for those policies that have harmed uh, African Americans that first settled in the one square mile of uh, the city of Decatur called Beacon Hill. And that's adjacent right to downtown where the high school is, where the courthouse is, uh, where the parking lot is for the, for the courthouse, where the school district is and the police department. That was all part of Beacon Hill where uh, black people lived and thrived going back to 1870s when the first freed African-Americans settled in that area. So I, my question is to you is, how do we take this knowledge and apply it in a very meaningful way to engage the community and to get the results that we all can agree that since black people have been harmed, we certainly need to be healed. Um, I'll just say that this is something that came up um, in the interviews as well. So for us who are here as academics, um, a lot of the people that I interviewed 
we're really interested in bringing some of this knowledge about doing archival work, about doing oral histories, about doing interviews, uh, about doing quantitative analysis to their conversations and being able to collaborate together. So there was a real need for that. Um, and so I do have the contact information for some of those participants if anybody's interested in doing that. Um, but it was really important, I think, for them to be able to connect with us. And I think that's a way that we can really directly get involved. So I just want to encourage that kind of work. And I think one of the other things that we have to, to do is recognize that where there are different media that we can use in order to convey this information because we have these massive generational gaps. And so we will have our traditional books, we will have our traditional articles, but we also need to think about the video format. So we need to think about YouTube. We need to think about Lord have mercy, TikTok, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but you can imagine when, when I, I, I was sitting next to my niece, my niece is of that generation. And she was just on her phone looking at these TikTok videos. And I thought, Lord, wouldn't this be a great way to be able to convey some of this information about the nation that she lives in, about the community that she lives in, if we could figure out how to do this. And so I think that that's the next step in terms of figuring out how to take it from the archives and get it out into the public. Um, and I have to say, with the YouTube, um, I did a talk here at Emory on white rage. That YouTube video has over 5 million viewings. I haven't sold 5 million books. <laughs> but, but the message from White Rage is being out there via YouTube. And so that is, to me, that is one of the ways that we do, we, we, we can um, distribute this work, this knowledge and get it into multiple audiences. And so we have to be really creative about that. And we have to have the kinds of folks who know technology in order to be able to do that. Thank you for this privilege. I am the last one to ask question. My name is Gregory Thomas. My name is Gregory Thomas. Looking at the video, I noticed the, the part that really captured my attention was Field Order 15. Now, Reverend Frazier did set a standard on how the compensation for reparation could be made. And it wasn't something for a, a seasonal stimulus or anything like that, but something that can go on for generations because there was, there's generational recovery mm -hmm. that needs to take place. However, at the White House, mm -hmm. President, the, the Democratic President Johnson amended that order and gave, and gave, and gave everyone back their properties. Mm -hmm. However, when, you, when you're only talking about four to eight million individuals, that you could have compensated at that time. Now those numbers have multiplied, and now there's a fear of putting the country into some level of debt. But the same country only needs three days to approve billions of dollars for any type of wartime effort. And it, it makes us wonder, what is really your priorities that's going on? But with the reparations, since it was actually canceled at the presidential level, then at the presidential level should be a prerequisite of who we should vote for for that position. Because it is at that position that it needs to trickle down and actually be approved for those who are actually in deserve of it. I strongly recommend um, um, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullins' book from Here to, Here to Democracy, that's the title, mm -hmm. Here to Equality. And that's Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullins, that's their position, that this is a federal problem and that the federal government owes the debt because, and he, he traces it back to this history where there was a moment where the federal government recognized that there was a debt that needed to be paid. 
Um, and, and, you know, historians say it's very different. They may have been just talking about those people who are assembled in that area, not just all black people. But again, the federal government owes that debt. And he suggests, they suggest that this would be fairly easy. I mean, of course, they're economists. And so they've worked out all of the numbers. But in terms of this notion about, well, we could not afford that as a country, their response is, well, what did you do during COVID? People just got checks. I mean, they found the money and people received checks. So there is a machinery in place. There is an infrastructure that could, in fact, deliver the return on the debt. And so I certainly um, recommend his work. It's, and again, um, Sandy and Kirsten are you know, very singularly focused on the federal government. Certainly, we know that we need reparations at all levels, but certainly their argument would be one that would be, I think, an answer to your question. And so from mm -hmm. here to equality, um, Kirsten Mullins and Sandy Darity, but they've worked it out. And they say, you know, it, it's, it would be a no-brainer. The government knows how to do this. We saw it. We saw it happen. Yeah. I'll, I'll add to that that um, Michael Dawson, in his book, I think Not in Our Lifetimes, he says that it's, it's, it's will, it's not a capacity problem, it's a will problem, right? And so that's essentially what you're getting at, right? It's, it's, it's the will. And so in the political science, I would say, well, what's the number one goal of politicians? Re-election. So if you want something to happen, even if it's a Democratic president, you're going to have to create that pressure to basically say you can lose your job. And I don't know, like you said, when you're hinting at a black agenda or an agenda or some type of political agenda of, for reparations, and I just don't think we're there yet. But I think that's kind of the strategy that you have to think about, right? If you want a president to do something, you have to make it very clear that you have the votes that you can take away from them, right? If they do not get in line. And I don't think we're at a point where we're organized enough around this issue to make that type of, of strategic um, decision or at demand. And it has to be at every level. So Beacon Hill, the folks at Beacon Hill need to organize who are the city council people, who are the individuals that are running for office. And so it, it comes down, it sounds simple, but we got to get out there and vote for the policies, not necessarily the people, but the policies that we believe various parties and individuals will represent that address some of the consequences of the period of enslavement, Jim Crow, all of the remnants of discrimination, there are policies that can, in fact, address these issues, but we need to vote for people who we know will push those policies through on the, on the municipal level, on the state level, on the federal level. So it, we've got to educate people about why you vote. We're not necessarily voting for people, we're voting for policies and appointments. I want to thank our panelists again. Let's give them one more round of applause. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. You did such a great job. We're so glad. Uh, I want to. I want to say to the audience, we will see you on Wednesday, January 24th at 5 p.m. for the reading and book signing of the Book of James. Bring a friend, but absolutely be here. I want to say again, thank you for coming. The Department of African American Studies thanks you. Um, Georgia Public Broadcasting thanks you. And I want to say, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Okay. Yeah.